Romans chapter 6 says, don't you know, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You know, as a Christian of some 43 years, uh, and I suppose a, a preaching and teaching minister over the last 22 years, uh, listening to the questions of people over the years, there often are questions about the significance of the meaning of baptism. Uh, part of the reason for those kind of questions, I suppose, is, is, is it seems like a, a pretty unusual practice to a lot of people. Like, and, and to those who are new to the church scene, it probably seems a bit strange, where if you've been coming to the church for a while, may, maybe not nearly as much. But imagine that you haven't been to a church, maybe ever. Okay? And you come in, and you sit down, and suddenly at some point in the service, adults stand up in a big bathtub and start dunking each other. You know, you go, what's that, right? I mean, I mean, it doesn't seem normal in this kind of a setting, right? And then what makes it even more unusual is they seem so happy about it, right? They seem happy about getting dunked. And think about it. It's one thing to be dunked by someone. It's another thing to come up and just celebrate what happened, right? Normally, that's not the case. So, yeah, it seems a bit strange. And sometimes people are so happy about getting dunked that they, I mean, you and you, you and I, we've seen it, okay? The makeup's running, the tears are running for joy, you know, and people watching on her clapping and celebrating about the whole thing. And so people new to it all may ask, what's that mean? What's that all about? Why do you celebrate that? And if you haven't been around church much, maybe you don't understand, okay? You don't understand in the same way that you don't really understand what just happened here this morning when we were worshiping, singing praises to God, saying we raise a hallelujah. What's that? right? It's strange, you know, maybe you look around and you think, what's wrong with these people? Honestly, I think those of us who have been Christ followers for a while, we forget just how strange it may seem to others that it's new to, okay? I mean, it's just one of those things that, unless you know, it's hard to explain, it's, it's hard to fully understand, and so they may not know, okay? Many of you know uh, that for five years while going to Bible college to get my preaching uh, degree and uh, ministry, it was a uh, then Cincinnati Bible College. I served as a campus minister to abused and neglected children at a children's home in Fortville. Children and youth who were very different than the youth I administered to uh, and, and children that I administered to as a volunteer in my home church for some 20 years. They were, they were very different, okay? And they were different not only because of their circumstances, but because most of them, if not all of them, had, a very, had very little exposure to spiritual teaching or a spiritual element of faith in their life. So it caught me completely off guard when the first time I took them to a youth conference, okay, and they had never been, of course, that when the part of the worship service came where they extended the opportunity to come forward, accept Christ, and be baptized, several of the youth, without saying a word to me, just jumped out of their row and ran down there in front of the gathering. And so I quickly took off after them because, like, their wards of the state, and I'm responsible for them. And when I talk to them, I asked them, what are you doing? What did you come forward for? And their response was pretty much basic. We have no idea, but they said you could come, and it sounded like fun to get baptized, so here we are. <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding. They, they had no idea. So I had to reel them in a bit and say, listen, uh, it, it, you know, it is a thing to celebrate, you know, but you need to have a better understanding because it's not only a sacred thing, but there's a serious commitment involved in it as well. Kyle Item, and many of you know him, we've done a couple of his studies here, and some of you have read his books. Uh, many years ago, he told of this early on in his ministry of a trip that he took uh, that made the meaning of baptism a lot more real to him. I, it was on a trip to the Ivory Coast of Africa on what he said is one year anniversary. So I guess it was maybe 20 some years ago. But he and his wife decided for their one year anniversary uh, to celebrate, they would go on a mission trip to the Ivory Coast. And as Kyle tells it, he said it wasn't super, you know, romantic. But what he remembers about it is that one day he had the opportunity to preach at a mosque. Okay. In his words, he said, I had really neat opportunity to stand right outside of a mosque and preach the gospel to a group of young, young 
Zeppelin men. And so I talked to them about the Son of God, talked to them about how he loves you. God's only son died for you, that you can be forgiven of your sins. And then he rose from the dead, and there's eternal life in him. And so he said, I had a great privilege of presenting the gospel to them. And when he finished, he said he noticed that one of the missionaries who had lived there, grew up there, went over to these young men, and he came back and reported that three of the men were going to be baptized that evening. And Kyle said, I was just ecstatic, you know, like I could not wait for the evening to come, but they were going to go home, the missionary said, and they were going to tell their families first and then come back in the evening for the baptism. And it was going, and then he was going to have the opportunity to baptize them. Cal said, I couldn't wait to do it. But then he said that evening, when the evening came, they came back uh, uh, to where they were, he said, I was surprised at what I saw because they were there by themselves. He said, I guess I was assuming it was like back home. I was assuming that they were going home to tell their family and friends, and then their family and friends would come back with them, and there would be these baptisms and this great celebration. But he said, that's, that's not what happened. He said, when they came back, they were all by themselves, and they were each carrying a suitcase, like old school, no wheel suitcase, kind of hauling these bags, and each of them had one. Kyle said, I didn't quite understand all that, but I was thrilled to be able to baptize them. So we filled up a kid's pool with water and I baptized them. But he said afterwards, he said, I was talking to the missionary about why no one was there to celebrate with them. And what's the deal with the suitcases? And the missionary explained to me that when they went home to tell their families, they would have been disowned by their families, which means they weren't so much going home to tell their families, they were going to say goodbye to their families for they would not have been welcomed back home. And the suitcases, he said, that's pretty much everything that they were allowed to take with them on their new life. And suddenly he said, I understood the meaning of accepting Christ and baptism in a little bit different way. That when we talk about it, now I understand the old is gone and the new has come, and that has real world implications. He said, now, in my mind, what baptism looks like is it looks like three young men coming by themselves with everything they own in a suitcase so that they can say yes to Jesus. So, so it is in baptism. There is this picture of a death, burial, and resurrection. For the old is gone and the new has come. Death, burial, and resurrection. Paul says it's of the first importance. And that was true for Jesus and it's true for you and I as well. You know, friends, uh, many of us, uh, we would want and, and to experience the power of the resurrection in our lives, right? I mean, I mean, we want to experience that new life, that powerful life that we talk about in Christ. But the truth is you can't experience the power of the resurrection in your life without experiencing a spiritual death. I mean, there's just no getting around that. Before there is a resurrection, there has to be a burial. And so for some of us who are needing some resurrection power, like we want a new life, we need a new life, a, a resurrected life, a resurrected marriage, a resurrected joy, a resurrected hope, whatever it may be. I mean, we want something new, but far too often we want something new that doesn't come without dying to the old. And so it's my hope this morning that we'll take a moment to see that we see this picture of this in baptism, I think, and it helps us understand the power of the resurrection as well as understand baptism. So in John chapter 11, 25 and 26, Jesus talks about the power of the resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. You hear what he said, Christ followers? He said, you'll never die. Everyone who dies to themselves spiritually never dies. And if you haven't already, please turn in your Bibles or Bible apps to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, and we're going to make reference to that throughout this morning, so please keep it open. Now, Romans 6 helps us understand how baptism fits into all this, and I, I read it once, I read it at the beginning of the message. We're going to look at it again piece by piece as we go along here. Verse 3 says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And then in verse 4 it says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we, may live a new, we too may live a new life or a new way of life, walk in a new way of life. So here's, here's what we need to see. Every uh, year, people come to Easter service, right? Like Easter, Resurrection Sunday, it's like the big Sunday of the year. That and Christmas, right? I mean, those are the big two, okay? Why, why do so many people turn out for that? Okay, why? Uh, well, to celebrate the event that's central to the faith, right? That's the big event. 
I mean, that's even why we worship on Sundays. It was Resurrection Sunday, not Re Resurrection Thursday. Resurrection Sunday, okay? That's why they celebrate the big event that, that's central to our faith, the death, burial, and primarily on Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. It's not just a celebration. It's also an invitation, right? It's an invitation. I mean, it's not just something that we remember that happened. It's an opportunity for us to live in it in our own lives, okay? And baptism captures that and, and so much more. But let us remember this. Uh, when you think about Easter or Resurrection Sunday, we're not just thinking about what Jesus did for us, but we're entering into it, okay? We are responding to an invitation to be a part of that, his death, burial, and resurrection. So this morning, I want to talk a little bit about how that's true. But before I jump into these images of Scripture that are going to help us not only understand baptism, but the invitation of the resurrection, here's, here's what I hope will happen in the next few moments, okay? First, to that group of people, if you've been baptized, I hope this will deepen your devotion and strengthen your commitment to Jesus, okay? That it will remind you of what happened uh, when you were baptized that you were entering into a spiritual death and i hope it will re recommit your heart as a follower of jesus christ and listen friends here's here's the truth uh, we don't talk about often enough uh, in the church because i suppose we're afraid of offending someone but some of the most miserable people i've ever known in church and we've all known people that are miserable right in church yes church i mean we we know who, right miserable people in church well they are miserable i think i mean i believe because they are people who don't understand that before there's a resurrection, there has to be a burial, right? I mean, they are people who try to live a life for Jesus without dying to themselves. And they are people who try to follow Jesus in a way that's maybe just halfway, that's close enough where they can get the benefits, but not so close that it requires anything of them. And the reason why this whole thing hasn't worked out for so many people, and so many of those miserable people have left the church I think the reason they leave and they're miserable is that they were trying to do it without dying, okay? Listen, friend, if you've been trying to follow Jesus without dying to yourself, trying to say yes to him without saying no to yourself, understand today that's not how it works. That's not how it works, okay? It's, it's not how it works. I promise, and if you try it that way, I promise you, you'll find no long-term joy in that. Okay, I mean, the beauty and the great irony of the gospel is, is that you, you only find life that is truly life when you die to who you are and what it is that you were living for. And you instead live for him, and baptism captures that, and I want to remind you and I of that this morning. Okay, so now, for some of you, uh, secondly, who, who believe in Jesus and call yourself a follower, but you've not been obedient in baptism my prayer is that as you listen today that you'll become determined to do so very soon okay and honestly the water is ready we could do it today okay but i want you to understand that baptism to be a christian is not a suggestion it's not a hey if you get around to it it'd be great if you could i mean it's definitely not that but what it is is it's a command okay and it's a command that's given to us in scripture and every person who becomes a follower of jesus christ in the book of acts which is where we see the church at its very beginning. Every single person who was a believer in Christ, they were baptized, every single one, okay? And there are all kinds of reasons why people believe in Jesus, but they don't follow through on this. I mean, for some, maybe it's because you've been putting it off, or maybe you didn't really think, you, you know, you understood the significance of it. Maybe you didn't, okay? And maybe it's, it's just that you didn't think it was that big of a deal, or maybe your parents had you baptized at an age, and, and you didn't understand that, you know, you were too young to really understand it, and, and it's only a decision that you can make. But my prayer is that whatever the reason, this time this morning as we talk about baptism would be a time to help you get to a place where you not only understand the death and resurrection of Jesus better, but you would join him in that. You would join him in that invitation by being obedient through baptism. And I would also say, uh, lastly, okay, thirdly, lastly, if you've been coming to church and you've been asking some questions, but you've never taken a step of saying, hey, uh, I, I want to put my trust in Jesus, this would be a good day to do that, okay? If you're at the very beginning, this would be a good day to do it. And listen, friends, the most common, uh, the most common comment that I hear is a reason for waiting is, well, I'm going to do that, but I need to get my life together first. I, I need to get some things taken care of. And as soon as that's done, then that's not how it works, okay? The invitation is to come as you are. 
and then the change takes place. So with all that said, let me give you just a couple images from Scripture that I hope will help us understand not only baptism, but the commitment of what it means to call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ. So if you're a note taker, here we go. First, baptism is a burial, okay? It's a burial. Uh, in Romans chapter 3, we looked at it earlier. You can look at your, your Bible there. It says, it starts out, you were baptized into his death. You were baptized in, don't you know that when you were baptized, you were baptized, you were baptized in his death. Now, the word baptized uh, that we read in the Bible translations today really isn't so much a translation as it is a transliteration. In other words, the ancient Greek word that is used there in the Greek is baptizo in the original Greek, and it's not really translated. It's just changed into an English word that I guess we just made up baptism okay baptize or baptism and so if we're looking to translate it into to understand its fuller meaning we would find it has several similar meanings for instance we'll we'll put this up on the screen for if you can make notes of this if you want to there's lexicon and it doesn't matter which lexicon you pull up but there's lexicon of greek words for the greek word baptizo list like a dictionary it lists several meanings okay and number one it says to immerse submerge like speaking of a vessel okay to submerge or immerse okay so it is a word that might be used when there was a ship that gets sunk at sea that goes underneath the water it's baptize okay baptize or, or a word that would be used for death where someone's buried under the ground it's a word that wasn't just capturing some you know some sentimental moment in a church service but it was meant to capture a dramatic death to our old way of life it's meant to capture a dramatic death even a violent death uh, to our old way of life. And still, even today, you sometimes hear Christians say a baptism, it's a watery grave. It's a watery grave, okay? For you're buried under the water. And that's one of the reasons why I, I, I sometimes get asked from time to time, hey, I, I, I've been sprinkled. Do I really need to be baptized? And they'll maybe say, your way, okay? And I'll say it as gently as I can, because listen, I get all the traditions and trappings around this, okay? So I'd, I'd be as gentle as I can, but so here's the thing. I have to say, they're two different things, okay? Sprinkle and baptize, they're two different things. The word baptizo, we looked in the Greek literary, is translated to bury, to dip, to plunge beneath, to immerse. It's a word that means, I mean, there's a different Greek word for sprinkle, and that word is where we get our word rain, and it's not the same thing, Okay? And the reason why this matters is, is that immersion captures us doing what Romans 6 talks about, that we are identifying with the death of Jesus Christ. We are being buried underneath the water, okay? And the reason so many people of faith can be confused about this is, is while most of the New Testament that we read, uh, we are reading words that have been translated, okay, from the ancient Greek to modern-day English a word in the Greek and you translate it into its meaning in English. That's a translation. Well, baptizo in the Greek is one of those words, and there aren't many of those like this in the Bible, but it's one of those words that has been transliterated, meaning we took baptizo and we just turned it into an English word, meaning we kind of made up our own English word, baptize, okay, or baptize. Again, instead of translate it, we transliterated it if it were translated, I think we'd understand a little bit more specifically what the image is or what the picture is. Like, like for instance, if we would translate it, John the Baptist would no longer be John the Baptist, okay? He would be like, you know, John the Immerser, John the Plunger, John the Dipper. I don't know what we would call him, but it wouldn't be John the Baptist, okay? In other words, it would be translated in a way that made a little more sense to us. Listen, I'm sensitive about how difficult that can be for so many people who thought sprinkling was that. But truly, there's a difference between those two things. And we're, when we're baptized, we go under the water. Now, how did that happen, people say? How did the church get to that place? Politics, okay? Anyway, you might, you might ask that. Well, hundreds of years ago, after the New Testament was written, sprinkling became a practice as a way to make baptism a little bit more convenient, okay? However, the point of baptism has never been convenience. I mean, that's not the point of it. For the point is to identify with the death of Jesus Christ. And death is many things, but it's never convenient, right? And so it was for convenient purposes, okay? Number two, for your notes, is baptism represents cleansing. There's Greek lexicon as a number two. Secondly, also says baptizo is to cleanse by dipping or submerging to wash to make clean with water, okay? Now, 
We understand this one a lot better. The imagery of water is an image used for cleaning, for washing. And so if we have dirt on our body, then we understand that water washes us, cleanses us. And so baptism is an image used in, in, with, that, with that in mind. You know, a few years ago, uh, I was asked to go on a trip with my daughter, uh, Cassie's uh, college tennis team, for spring break uh, for a week of tennis matches down at uh, Kissimmee or uh, Kissimmee, Florida, whichever way you want to say it. Uh, it was a, the women's team, and, and what we did is we left Marion University, and we only went about halfway. I think we stopped in Kentucky about the halfway point, and I was asked to accompany some of the girls while they checked into their rooms to make sure, first of all, they got in safe and that they were set up okay, and so this, we, w so I did that. So this one young lady, once in the room, opens her backpack and pulls out a set of sheets, a pillowcase, and a blanket, and a can of aerosol spray and begins to remake her bed. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, you don't think I'm going to sleep in those, do you? They're covered in someone's filth. And I was like, you know, I, honestly, it wasn't the finest room I've ever stayed in a hotel, but, I mean, it looked pretty decent, and the bed looked freshly made. And so she proceeded to tell me that she has watched videos on YouTube of how you can take this special light, some kind of special black light, and I guess it exposes all the bacteria and the germs and the stains, and I guess, according to her... You know, when you put this light on hotel rooms, especially sudden, you see, you can see the filth everywhere. And, you know, it's on the comforter, it's on the walls, it's on the remote control. Anybody have plans this weekend to travel to a hotel? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's just there. She said there's germs everywhere. And I said again, as she was pulling out the can of air to spray the whole room down, I said, it looks clean to me. And she said with great confidence, well, trust me, it's not. <laughs> With total confidence. And I kind of believed her, but not having brought any clean sheets in my bag and not being able to see it, I pretended my bed sheets were clean. <laughs> and I slept pretty okay. It did take me a little longer that night to go to sleep, but it, I, I, it was okay. Here's my point. You ever do that? Like, you're fine with it as long as you don't see it, right? Uh, I mean, I, I've, I've slept in my share of hotel rooms, and those germs, I guess they've always been there, and they're always going to be there, but as long as I don't have to look at it, I'm okay with it. Now, here's the thing. I have checked into rooms where I can see it's not clean. Uh, once uh, I look at it, uh, and then it becomes a problem. If I can see it, it's a problem, okay? I mean, years ago, and I've told you this before, but for those that have never heard, years ago, long before we came to ministry here, we were bringing our daughter out to Indianapolis for a mission trip, and we happened to stop in the middle of the night in Newcastle, Indiana, for the first time in our lives, uh, long before we moved here. And I've told you this, but desperate for a room in the middle of the night, we checked into a place, and let's just call it the Newcastle Inn, Okay. Yeah. And uh, which uh, no longer exists, okay? And I could see stains on the comforter, stains on the wall, stains on the ceiling, stains everywhere. And only because there were no rooms in any other inn in town, we stayed there. But we never pulled that comforter back. We just spread our coat out on the bed and we kept our clothes on and we slept with our clothes on, okay? Why? Because we could see it wasn't clean, okay? <laughs> but what a lot of us do instinctively, intuitively, don't look for the stains, okay? Like, like we just do our best to live our life in such a way that we pretend like they're not even there, and everything's fine, and it's okay, and so I don't really need to deal with it, and cleansing, it's not that important. And we live in a world that honestly has so many stains, so many, so many stains, that it's, it's not easy to notice our own, okay? I mean, and so that's how we tend to live. And we avoid, you know, places like this, where we are this morning, where a different light gets shown on things, and because suddenly, I mean, we avoid because suddenly we see some things that maybe we didn't see before, and it makes us uncomfortable. But the Bible makes it clear that all of us have these stains. All of us. Did you hear me, church? We all, we all have these stains on our souls. Listen to 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. John says, if we, and he's talking about Christians, he's talking to Christians about we, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, however, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us, there it is, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we have all types of stains on our soul, right? I mean, and we try to explain them away maybe, and so you get into a fight with your spouse and you talk in a way that you know doesn't really honor them or God, or you say things that you know you shouldn't 
and then the way we react to this instead of looking at it fairly is that we just well you know it's just some personality difference and we have some communication problems and and you don't really you know see a stain on your soul or we feel judgmental or self-righteous towards someone and we actually use them to make ourselves look better and we actually use them to hide our own stains right that's what we're doing hiding our own stains when in reality our judgment and our self-righteousness is shining a light on the stain of our soul for other people they can see it okay and the truth is friends we just all of us we have them we have them and peter connects for us how this practice of baptism captures the cleansing that's found in jesus christ first peter chapter 3 verse 21 it says that water is a picture of baptism which now saves you not by removing dirt from your body but as a response to god from a clean conscience it gives you a clean conscience before god it is effective because why is it effective church family because of the resurrection of jesus christ the death burial it's only effective because of the death burial and resurrection of jesus christ it's the death burial and resurrection that makes it effective the only power that there is in this world for cleansing us is found in jesus christ now let's be clear baptism doesn't save you i mean take for instance our baptistry back here i tell people uh, usually we have an opportunity to go back there before someone's baptized and I get to have a little talk with them about what's going to be taking place and I always point to the water and I say that's New Lisbon water that's New Lisbon water in there and it doesn't cleanse you right no chance it's Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus that saves us and makes us clean and baptism captures that truth and the reality of it's the reality of what only Jesus can do for us, okay? It gives us a clean conscience before God. So look, most of us know this or have some point in our faith known this. People express it when they come up from beneath the water, what it feels like to have a clean conscience before God, okay? And one of the big things that it is is it, it, it not only removes the sin, but it removes the shame connected to the sin, right? Shame is removed. I mean, the struggle that we have with sin it comes out in shame. It, shame's a big deal, okay? Because what others may not see in us, we know it's there. We know it's there. And biblically speaking, it's shame that separates us from God. Like Adam, he sinned, had shame, and it caused him to hide from God, okay? And it's shame that causes us to separate ourselves from other people, cast blame on other people. And it's shame that causes you to be isolated from other people and from God. I mean, it's like a small child who knows they've done something wrong, right? and they go off, right? I mean, you don't really want to be around people when you have shame, and you're not, you're, a small child doesn't even really know why, but they know, right? It's shame. It's, it's shame because perhaps over here, you know, we have this shame that's just part of our life or part of your life, you know, my life, or maybe you're not making the connection, you know, it's there, but you're not making the connection, but it's all connected or shame is often, not always, but often the root of anxiety. Shame is often the foundation of depression that you're struggling with. It's just increasingly, I'm increasingly convinced that it's not just sin, but it's the shame that goes along with it, you know, and the Bible says that Jesus allows us to have a clean conscience before God. In other words, he deals with our shame. In fact, he takes our shame on himself and he cleanses us. He washes us and he sets us free. And before there's a cleansing, you might want to write this down if you're a note taker. I don't think it's up on the screen. But before you can have a cleansing, there needs to be a conviction. Right? There needs to be a conviction. We see this in the first baptisms of Christ church. Find it in the book of Acts. And so in Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches on the very first day the church begins. And the people there knew that they were guilty. Okay, I mean, they recognized the stains on their soul and they knew. Okay, uh, And then they said, oh, we need to do something about that. Okay, And so in verse 37, it says this. When the people heard Peter's sermon, they were cut to the heart, meaning they were convicted. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, what do we do? What shall we do? What should we do about this? And so they believe in Jesus, that he's the son of God. They are convicted of their guilt, of their sin. They connect this to their shame. And they say to Peter, like, what do we do now? What should we do? And Peter says then in verse 38 of Acts chapter 2, he says, well, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins that you might be cleansed, you know, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, this promise is for you and your children and all for who are far off, all on whom the Lord our God will call. So this promise, this promise that Peter's talking about 2,000 years ago, it's not just for them, he says, 
It's forever, he says. It's for all who are far off. It's for all those who are sitting and listening and thinking. Uh, maybe this was true for them, but is it true for me? Is this something I need to do? Is it true for me? Yes, it's true for you, too. For all those that are far off, for all those that believe, repent and be baptized, he says. And he gives a very simple parallel. Uh, this is right out of Acts chapter 2. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so Romans chapter 6 captures for us this supernatural connection. Supernatural connection. Where we see this similar idea, idea in marriage. Like we know this about marriage. God brings together a man and a woman, right? And the Bible talks about uh, there's unity in that, in marriage, right? And uh, he says there's a oneness, a oneness, okay? A word for it in the Old Testament is a, a mingling of the souls, okay? So there's a supernatural bringing together that God ordains in marriage between a husband and a wife being married. They become how many? One. Yeah, baptism, same way. And there's some of this language in Romans 6 to help us understand that about I'm going to kind of run down through these verses here. Verse 3, he says, you're baptized into Christ. Into Christ. Also, verse 3, we were baptized into his death. Verse 4, we were buried with him. Verse 5, we have been united with him. Verse 6, our old self was crucified with him. Verse 8, we died with him. Verse 8 again says, and we also live with him. Okay, so, you know, baptized into him, buried with him, united with him, crucified with him, die with him, and then live with him. It's just repeated over and over and over again, church. And when God repeats something, it means what? It means it's important. So what's so important? That we're, to be united in him, we're with him. We're into him. It's just a lot of connecting language here, and it just keeps emphasizing that there's something that happens when we're obedient in baptism that brings some things together, okay? Let me ask you all, uh, uh, how many people here cook and bake? It's okay. I, I have my hand up, okay? Yeah, a lot of people, okay. You ever ask someone, I mean, like, you know how to make cookies, and they know how to make cookies, and you're making the same cookies, but you ask for their recipe, why is that? Do you not know the ingredients? Right? I mean, don't you know? I mean, why do we ask for other people's recipes? Because they got something in theirs that we don't, right? I mean, there's something in there that's happening that's not happening in ours. You know, or, or I mean, I mean, so if you're, yeah, I mean, of course you have ingredients. Like, if you, to bake a cake, you would have all kinds of ingredients, right? Like, you might have milk, flour, sugar, cocoa, eggs, right? That, those are common. Okay, and listen, if you've never made a cake, how many people have never made a cake, but you've eaten one? Okay, okay, well, that's the, the third that was missing. Okay, so now we got everybody. Okay, you've, you've never made one, but you've eaten one. And you just know, I mean, common sense would tell you that there's certain ingredients that you know are going to be in there. Like, like you would think, okay, milk, flour, sugar, cocoa, yeah, that makes sense. And what might not make sense, though, is if you had uh, eaten a cake but never made one would, would be eggs, right? Like, you know, like maybe to you, eggs seem strange. Okay, like what's the point of putting eggs in the cake? Surely the taste of the flavor of the cake surely won't be impacted by not having eggs. You ever like make something and you don't have it and you go, we'll skip that. <laughs> How many, come on, you're in God's house. Put them up high, be proud. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah, me too. Okay, yeah, well what would happen without eggs? Well, if you made the cake and you just did, you know, flour, sugar, milk, cocoa, but you left out the eggs and mix it all together, put it in the oven, and then you pull it out and you go to eat it, what's going to happen? Like, bakers, it's going to what? Latin, it's going to fall apart. Yeah, I mean, it's going to come apart, okay? And uh, it would just, it wouldn't stay together. Why? Because eggs in that recipe, among other things, is the bonding agent, okay? It's the bonding agent. It's used to bring all those things together. So, yeah, it might seem out of place. You might think about skipping over eggs, but the truth is if you take out the bonding agent, then you'll have all these ingredients, and there's nothing there to bring them all together. Baptism is talked about that way in Romans chapter 6, okay? That it's a bonding agent, that Jesus is our salvation, Jesus is the power, it's Jesus who saves us, and it's Jesus who cleanses us, but there's something that happens in baptism that brings them all together. So, what, if I find, what, I, what I find interesting about Romans 6, and it's the reason for the title of the message, so don't you know, 
where it says, it says that several times. If you read through 8 and into 9, you'll see that it says that several times. Don't you know? Or don't you know? Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to Christians, right? The passage is written, it's a letter written to Christians, and he's saying, don't you know? Which you would think they would, right? I mean, they've been baptized, you would think they know. But apparently they didn't know. Or maybe they once did, but now they need some reminding according to, you know, according to God, you know. Or maybe they need some rebuking because they are using God's grace as a license to sin. But whatever the cause, it's, it's a good explanation of what happens beneath the water. For there is this uniting, this bonding, this identifying with Jesus that brings a new way of life now and forevermore. You know, a little over a year ago, our daughter Sherry uh, went with a church uh, from Tennessee, a Tennessee group, to the Holy Lands. And she said it was so faith-building. She said, Dad, to walk the streets that Jesus walked, to go to the towns and the cities that Jesus ministered in, it was so inspiring, it was so encouraging. And in particular, she mentioned two things that stood out in her mind. She said, Dad, to walk the same road from Jerusalem to the place where Jesus was crucified. Wow. To stand on the bank of the Jordan River where he was baptized. She sent us a picture of the Jordan where people, I, I knew this, uh, I've heard this before, that when you go to the Jordan River, uh, you have an opportunity, they'll, they'll baptize you. Uh, even if you've been baptized, they'll baptize you again in the Jordan River. And so uh, you know, she sent a picture of that, you know. But when I saw the Jordan River, to be honest with you, it took me back a little bit because it was not what I thought. I mean, it, it's fairly narrow, okay? Uh, not as wide as I imagined in my mind, and it was really stained like chocolate milk. And she said, apparently, Dad, it's like that all the time. It looks dirty. <laughs> okay? And when I asked her, well, were you baptized? Because I never asked her beforehand whether she planned. I just thought I'd let her do it and ask her after. But anyway, she said, yeah. And I said, well, how many in the group were baptized? And keep in mind, these are Christians, many if not all, already baptized. She said, Dad, at least 90%, if not way more. Only a few did not. She said, I think that was because of physical limitations. But why? Why? I asked her, why? Why do you think they do it? I mean, if they've already been, why, why here? Why now? She said, I suppose like me, somehow I wanted to identify with Jesus. I wanted to be united with him in that way. And Dad, she said, it was so uplifting. The whole experience really to walk where Jesus walked, to be baptized in the same way, the same place that Jesus was baptized. It's just a bonding experience. Listen, friends, the beauty is you don't have to go to Israel to experience that. Okay, you don't. I mean, that's nice, but you don't have to do that. For it's not the place or the water that bonds you. Okay, it's the sharing and the death, burial, and resurrection that bonds you. It's an invitation in. And you can do that anywhere, any place. In fact, you can do it here today. And if you've ever been where someone is baptized and you've seen or wondered why it is that we celebrate a cheer and a pod and carry on, it's because in Christ, the old is gone and the new has come. And all God's people said, let's pray. Father, we give thanks uh, for the love uh, and the mercy and the grace that you have extended through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we give thanks for his obedience, his obedience, Lord, that uh, when you say he does, and uh, we give thanks for his death, burial, and resurrection, that we may have a new life in him. We give thanks for the invitation, Lord. We know it's not something we can earn or something that we deserve or something that we merit, but it's favor given without deserving and so lord we give thanks that you love us so much that you would give and lord we give thanks for the spirit that we receive along with forgiveness of sins lord that we may walk a new life and lord as we get ready to depart this place today lord we pray that we would leave here walking in the spirit as christ walked in the spirit and live a new way of living that others around it'd be like we we're a bright light shining in a dark world that others would be drawn in that they might live it too and so, Lord, we pray it would be so. We give thanks for your love. We give thanks for your grace. We give thanks for Jesus and his obedience to the cross. And, Lord, we give thanks that we have new life through the forgiveness of sins and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. We pray it brings glory to Jesus. We pray it brings glory to his kingdom. It's in his name we pray.
Amen. I'm going to sing a song of invitation this morning, a song of response, and and uh, and it's a it's an invitation to to enter into the resurrection, a new way of life. Okay, and uh, maybe you need ministry this morning. Um, you, maybe you need to pray with someone or share someone or talk with someone about something, whatever it may be. Maybe you need to start your new life in Jesus Christ. Whatever the decision is this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and sing the song in response. Won't you come? Won't you come? <laughs> 